exciting to uh, be able to present to you the uh, high blood pressure material. And, um, you know, this has been a labor of love for over the last uh, several years. You know, we got into um, just a, a full uh, effort with uh, teaching people about natural ways to help their blood pressure in uh, about 2015 now. We really started going on it. And it was uh, myself, uh, Dr. David DeRose and uh, Trudy Lee who uh, joined together and um, came up with the, uh, the idea with the book. And we went ahead and um, uh, um, put it together and it took some time to uh, do that. But um, I'm so glad that we did. And um, uh, it's, it's gonna be a pleasure to share with you. I just wanna share with you my phone number. If any of you have any, uh, any concerns, anything you wanna talk about, I know I don't, know several of you well at this point, but um, want to get to know you better. And uh, if you have th uh, questions about high blood pressure, etc., you know, please, uh, please feel free to share those with me. Um, there's my phone number. Also, um, certainly uh, share those with the uh, table hosts and, um, and I, I, I'm uh, always available um, in that regard. Um, I have a background as a family physician and also in preventive medicine and uh, um, have a master's in nutrition and have enjoyed uh, uh, teaching and, and studying nutrition for a long time. Here's my family, uh, my beautiful two kids and my wife, and hopefully things will stay quiet in this uh, rambunctious ho household while I'm uh, talking to you. But if you hear any noises, that's them, and uh, it's just part of the uh, household uh, activities. Here's the book, and um, if you miss something or, or, or don't catch something, um, it's certainly available there. And um, we're excited to be able to uh, uh, give you this book if you come to all four presentations and, and uh, we'll give it to you at the end. So let's go get into our talk now. So let's talk about high blood pressure in the United States. And um, you know, high blood pressure is a big problem throughout the US. It's especially a problem in the South. Um, Tennessee is right in the middle of it. Um, about a third of um, Tennessee uh, folks have high blood pressure, a third, one in three. It's pretty phenomenal and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, right up there with um, the other states uh, in, on the southeast part of the, the uh, continent. As you get older, your blood pressure goes up. Um, that's what this slide shows. Um, uh, here's the percentage of people with high blood pressure and you can see as the age uh, um, changes, the um, the blood pressure uh, frequency goes up. So, uh, you know, why is blood why is blood pressure dangerous? You know, um, it reminds me of a story of, you know, my uh, um, patient who um, had just moved. Uh, this was when I was living on the West Coast. Had just moved over from the Midwest, and his wife had urged him to go to quit farming, and move because he was having health problems. He was having high blood pressure and diabetes and and uh, a lot of uh, uh, issues with that. And so she was hopeful that if they moved to the coast and, and started a more relaxing lifestyle that that would make a big difference. And, and she brought him in because he was having some chest pain issues. He was having uh, some, some dizziness and, um, but he wasn't uh, concerned about it. He's like, oh, it's no big deal. Whereas she's sitting there kind of uh, holding the, uh, the bench kind of white knuckling uh, through the whole visit. And um, we talked and, and I, I offered them a workup and uh, he was not particularly interested in it, but um, um, we started uh, on that process and uh, he did uh, start to do that um, because of his wife's wishes. And, uh, and I offered him an opportunity to come to a, a program very similar to this one where uh, you know, we're giving uh, talks on health and, uh, and cardiovascular disease, blood pressure. And uh, I rolled into the uh, evening program. Uh, this was back when we were doing everything in person. <laughs> and uh, there he was, and I was so excited to see him. But the problem was, is he was in his truck and he was backing out of the uh, parking lot while I was coming in. And I got out of my car and, and I went up to his vehicle and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? We'll call him uh, Bruce. How are you doing, Bruce? And uh, Bruce uh, was like, you know, thank you, Dr. Steinke. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to you know, join your program. But, you know, I got a lot of things going on and I got to I gotta uh, take off and I got some work to get done and, and so on and so forth. And, and he just wasn't interested, even though he, <laughs> he checked it out. 
uh, for a for a minute. Anyways, uh, I, I had a, a really bad feeling about him, and uh, I, I let him go. But uh, you know, he, um, you know, I never saw him again. I got a call a couple weeks later that um, from a physician in the hospital um, who was doing hospital care that he had had a, a devastating stroke, um, and um, he uh, she didn't think he was going to live through it, and he didn't. And that's the, uh, that's the consequences of high blood pressure. You feel fine many times, or you maybe have occasional little symptoms, but um, the devastating event is uh, sometimes just around the corner and you don't know when it's about to happen. And so he had a stroke and that stroke killed him. And I'm so sorry that happened. His wife was devastated. Uh, the confusion um, that can happen um, if you're getting confused with your blood pressure being high, that's called hypertensive encephalopathy. The aneurysms can happen all over the body, but especially in the aorta and also in the brain, they're common. Um, you can have changes in your eyes that can eventually lead to blindness. Um, heart attacks are very much uh, related to blood pressure and then kidney failure. Um, high blood pressure is, is one of the most common causes of uh, dialysis and kidney failure. And of course, um, now that COVID-19 has come along, if you have high blood pressure, you're twice as likely to get severe COVID-19. And so that's uh, something to think about. Not only is high blood pressure bad, but treating it and getting it down uh, is good. And so um, we want to get the blood pressure down. We wanna get it treated. Um, here's the stroke example. So um, if you are under the age of 60 and um, you, um, get your blood pressure treated, um, your risk of a stroke drops in half. And I wish that would have happened for Bruce. Um, if you are above 60, your blood pressure still, or, or your, your risk of, of a stroke still drops um, by 40%. So 50% if you're under 60, 40% if you're above 60. And um, you, can, you can do something about your risk of stroke. So what is blood pressure? Many of us know this already, but it's the force um, through your arteries. As the blood leaves the heart, the top number is the peak force when the heart's just pushing the uh, blood out. Um, it's the peak force as the force goes up, the arteries dilate some and, and embrace that force. Um, and then the bottom uh, number is, um, the top number is called systolic, the, the bottom number is called diastolic. And that's kind of when the heart's relaxing and the pressure is dropping down to its lowest level. So how high is too high? Well, um, here's one definition. Elevated blood pressure, ele elevated pressures represent forces high enough to cause problems to organs and tissues at the end of your pipes. So um, a definition uh, that uh, has been used for years now, um, uh, no uh, normal is less than 120 over 80. Um, in between that's prehypertension. Once you get to 140 over 90, you're in stage one. And then 160 over 100 is stage two. These were the JNC7 guidelines that have been uh, standard for a long time. Um, uh, recently, um, the uh, American Heart Association um, did some adjustments feeling that, that people should get their blood pressure even lower. And we'll look at some of that data so you understand some of the nuance there, but um, there are some drawbacks to that and it hasn't been fully embraced by the medical world by any means at this point. All right, so here's an example uh, of many examples like this. Um, here's the Mr. Fit study, uh, a trial that was very large, um, looking at um, the uh, risk factors related to um, heart disease, um, for example, heart disease death in, the, in this case on this uh, um, slide. And so you can see um, as the blood pressure comes down, so here's the kind of the higher level, 151 over 98 uh, at, at decile 10. As you move down the deciles, your blood pressure drops. And so your blood pressure, um, you know, your risk of a heart disease death is, is lowest when the blood pressure is the lowest. And so that's the general principle is, is, you know, you want your blood pressure lower if at all possible. And Mr. Fit uh, showed that this was, there was no medications used. It was just um, showing the, uh, the uh, associations um, with uh, heart, heart disease death and what the people's blood pressure was as they were going through the trial. Um, here's uh, the same trial looking at stroke death. And this uh, is even a greater um, kind of uptick as you go through the 10 deciles. Same blood pressure numbers. You can see the systolic there, the diastolic on the bottom. 
And as your uh, blood pressure goes up, you got to have a significant increases in risk. You know, I mean, you wouldn't think 150 over 98 is all that high. Maybe it's a little elevated, but look at the risk of a stroke death, eightfold for systolic above 151. Um, and, um, you know, for a diastolic above 98, it's, it's more than a fourfold increased risk. So that's a big deal. And that's something that uh, we need to pay attention to, you know, getting your blood pressure down into these areas here is, is ideal. And your risk starts to go up as soon as you're above 120 for sure. But um, the lower, the better um, within, within reason, of course, you know, don't, you don't want to be dizzy. You don't want to um, be cold all the time because low blood pressure tends to make people a little bit feel a little cold in the hands. And uh, so, but it, it does lower your risk of, of stroke and heart attack. So what causes high blood pressure? This has been a phenomenon of study for a long time. It's definitely been something that's not been easy to tease out. Um, for most uh, cases, there's no obvious treatable cause. You can't just pin it your finger on one thing and say, that's it. Um, and so they've called it essential, meaning that it's, it's you know, multiple kinds of things uh, going on. Usually there's genetic uh, underlying issues. Many times there's intrauterine issues. So that's in, in the womb when you're a little baby. Um, there's things that may have happened there that set you up for blood pressure. And then of course, lifestyle environmental factors are playing a, a big role as well. But you know, there's an important message that I want to tell you is that two people might follow identical lifestyles, but due to uh, different inherited tendencies, one may have high blood pressure and the other may not. And so keep that in mind, this is um, a big uh, point. Why, some, why are some at particular risk for high, hypertension? Well, um, it, it has a lot to do with the kidneys. The kidneys are the usual culprit. And when you're in utero, um, how your kidneys develop play a big role. They learned a lot about this from kidney transplantation. If you have a person who needs a kidney transplant, their blood pressure will change based on the person who gives the kidney. So if whatever the person who gives the kidneys blood pressure was, now the person who received the kidney, generally speaking, will have that new blood pressure level. So um, that's, that's a very common phenomenon that they see in kidney transplantation. And it taught us that the kidneys have a lot to do with this. Um, you know, again, problems in utero, the intrauterine growth restriction issues. Um, you know, if you're a very small baby, um, that pl plays a role. And um, um, the issues related to um, the third trimester of gestation um, uh, is, is when your nephrons are formed. These are the the little tiny uh, units that filter the blood. There's millions and millions of them in your kidneys. And um, depending on how many you start with, um, as those break down through your life, um, they play a big role in uh, when, when you get high blood pressure in many people. All right, so that's, uh, that's very important. And they, less of the nephrons develop when you're stressed, when the baby's stressed. So if mama's stressed or baby's stressed for some reason, um, there's something called uteroplacental insufficiency, where there's an inadequate blood, uh, blood flow from the mother to the fetus. This stresses the fetus. And if it's happening in the third trimester, it's uh, playing a role in their nephron development, the, the little, little units that develop. And of course, um, this is a, uh, a function of the stress hormones like uh, glucocorticoids and, uh, and uh, you know, cortisol and so on. Okay, so um, because of those factors, um, although we'll be looking at lifestyle and other natural therapies, and they're very important, the presence of hypertension does not necessarily mean a person is following a poor lifestyle. So if they have high blood pressure or hypertension, it doesn't mean that they're not um, doing their best to follow a good uh, lifestyle. And you know, can we, can we all learn more? Yeah, absolutely, we can all do better. But um, you know, it doesn't mean that, that they're just totally flunking out. Um, so how, uh, how well are Americans doing at controlling their blood pressure? Well, um, this is from the NHANES uh, data. This is a national survey that's done every year um, on, um, on people um, and they collect the data and then um, submit uh, um, reports on a regular basis on various topics. And when they looked at the blood pressure, um, you can see that the awareness of people as you go from the 1970s into the 2008 well, was the last one that we had on this um, that I've seen. Um, your the awareness has been improving. The treatment's been improving. This is percentages, um, percentage of people 
Um, so the treatments have been improving and the control has been improving, but it's still very, very poor. And so if you have 50% of people controlled, that's still not uh, all that great, is it? And so what, what's the reason? Why are, are people a lot less uh, controlled than we would hope for? You know, I mean, if people are treated, why aren't they controlled too? You know, why, why aren't these the same? Well, um, could it be that the less than optimal control rates um, relate to the patient's lack of acceptance regarding the conventional approach to high blood pressure? And what is the conventional approach? Uh, you all know it. Um, it's related to the, the pills the doctors prescribe. And although the experts recognize over and over and over that lifestyle is powerful, um, the focus um, and the foundation um, almost always is the medications. Here's a great example from the National Health Statistics Reports. Um, this whole article from September 19, 2017 looks at primary care physicians and um, uh, visits with patients diagnosed with hypertension. And you could read this whole thing and there's really no focus at all on lifestyle. The whole focus is on medications and how well patients are taking them and what ones are taking and so on and so forth and how often doctors are giving it. And so uh, Dr. Cronish uh, back in 2011 um, summarized it wonderfully by this statement, although counseling about lifestyle factors plays a role, prescribing antihypertensive medications remains the cornerstone of the medical management of hypertension. All right, so um, what is the biggest problem of, of uh, you know, blood pressure therapy? There you see it, I, I clicked it up too soon there. <laughs> Anyways, the most common problem um, is that there are symptoms related to taking the medication so often, side effects, uh, frequent urination, fatigue, dizziness, cough, exercise issues, sexual dysfunction, depression. And how many symptoms do people have when they have untreated uh, high blood pressure? Most of the time, most of the time people actually feel nothing. They feel nothing. They feel just fine, thank you. And so if they go from this to feeling worse, that's not a great incentive to uh, continue the medication and so on. And so it's, it's a battle. Um, here's an example of the adherence rates of the medication. So here's different classes of medication. Um, you can see that uh, some of the classes, the beta blocker is very poor. The uh, angiotensive two uh, receptor blockers like Losartan and Intelmisartan, et cetera, much better. But even so, you know, much of the medicine is only taken about half the time um, over 12 months, and, and that's not real good. All right, um, you know, having said that, there are dangers with overtreating um, high blood pressure. This has been a long-term debate going on in the medical <laughs> literature. There's been you know, many, many, many trials, many, many observational studies um, seeing the same uh, kind of effect, where as you bring the blood pressure down with medication, so this is with medication now. Um, it, it does quite well. And then there's kind of a, a nadir, um, usually around 130 with the medication. And as you pull it down too far for these patients who are on medication, you actually begin to see an uptick in, um, in cardiovascular deaths, heart attacks, strokes, heart failure. And so um, that is a, an issue. And, um, and that's, uh, that's something we need to consider. And so in other words, the common solution for high blood pressure, as in medications, may create more pressure than the hypertension itself. Could there be a better way? Well, of course there's a better way, you know. Medications have their place. There are, are certainly people who need to take medications. But um, if you're not optimizing and full and fulfilling the potential of the uh, better ways, the other ways, um, you're not um, uh, meeting the, uh, the, the benefits that you could achieve. And so could there be a no pressure solution? And that's our book, uh, the no pressure solution to blood pressure. And it's a framework, uh, it's an acronym and it's a framework to give you um, the general structure of areas that we found um, during our research to uh, be quite helpful to lower blood pressure. So here's our, uh, our, um, our acronym, no pressure, nutrition, optimal choice of beverages, physical exercise, rest, environment, stress management, social support, use of natural adjuncts, refraining from pressors and excesses, and exercising faith in God. So during our program, we're gonna go through each of these uh, topics and we're gonna look at the research and um, we're gonna do our best to teach you something about uh, these things. 
All right, so, but there are a few ground rules that you need to know when it comes to natural medicines, natural therapies, natural remedies. You know, if you're on blood pressure medicine now, never abruptly stop the blood pressure medications. There are certain blood pressure medications that if you abruptly stop them, you will just have a spike in your blood pressure and you could have a heart attack just from that. Um, that has happened, it's called rebound hypertension. Um, eliminating other drugs has on occasion triggered heart attacks. So that's what I just said. So that's uh, really important. It is best to inform your doctor if making significant lifestyle changes. So if you're learning things in this program, you decide, you know what? I could do a lot better. I wanna do a lot better. And you start making significant changes. Um, it's very important that you tell your doctor about it and that you monitor your blood pressure very carefully. We recommend in our book to check three times a day while you're ch making changes to make sure your blood pressure is not dropping too quickly. And if it is dropping, you know, you can rejoice. That's excellent. But uh, we want to make sure that uh, the medications are being adjusted appropriately. Okay, and um, also remember um, the power of addition. You know, um, we're going to be talking about many different therapies that in and of themselves, the research often shows that there's only a few point benefit, maybe, maybe five points, maybe 10 points sometimes. But as you pull all these things together and you start to, in a more global way, improve your physiology so that your body takes care of the blood pressure itself, um, you begin to um, have a, a much larger impact. And this takes some uh, weeks sometimes to pull all these uh, lifestyle changes together. And so um, that's really important. So you say, for example, you have natural remedy A that lowers blood pressure three points uh, you know, on the systolic, two points on the diastolic. You have B, natural remedy B, that lowers systolic blood pressure four points um, and then diastolic blood pressure only one point. And then you have natural remedy C, lowers uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressures two points. Well, let's take those all together. You might think, well, then that's just added effects. You just add it up and that's what it's gonna be. But in fact, what we find often is that it's not just additive, it's multi multiplicative. And uh, you know, you, instead of getting a nine point and a five point improvement with the added effects, you often will get a 13 and 10 point improvement, uh, for example, um, when you add things together. And so that's a really important point. Okay, so we're gonna look at the first two this, uh, uh, this time and uh, we'll cover some of the details with that. And um, um, then we'll, we'll uh, um, end our talk. So three key nutrition principles. So um, not principle number one, very, very important, increase plant food consumption. That's why we're gonna have a cooking demonstration, a, a little, little video for you with uh, Rachel um, every time, because we want you to learn something about uh, increasing your plant cons food consumption. Find ways to improve and increase what plants you're eating. Um, control calories, you know, um, make note of, of where the calories are and um, you know, start, uh, start trying to, um, cut back on, on really uh, problem foods, problem areas, and see if uh, some of the pounds can uh, improve uh, for those who need it. And then uh, decrease salt intake. Um, that's uh, certainly important. And um, when you increase your plant food consumption, you get more potassium and you lower your salt intake. They work hand in hand to really help your, your blood pressure. So let's take a look at the plants. Um, so do the typical diet practice make a difference? So um, this is a, a very important study, a very large study an NIH-funded study on the Adventist Health Study 2. The Adventists are a very uh, unique bunch because um, about half of Adventists eat meat and about uh, uh, most Adventists do not smoke or do not drink. And so um, some of those confounding variables are not present, but, it gives, uh, but there's a wide variety of different diets within the Seventh-day Adventist community. And so it's a great opportunity to study the science. And so you can see here that um, um, when it comes to uh, hypertension, let's look on the, on the right part of that graph. Um, the risk of getting high blood pressure um, is different depending on the kind of diet you're following. So non-vegetarians um, had the highest risk of getting um, high blood pressure. And then semi-vegetarians, they are, are those who eat red meat, poultry, or fish less than once a week. They had a 25% reduction in getting hypertension. And then those who had um, uh, were uh, fish, you know, pesco vegetarians, um, were at about a 40% reduction in getting high blood pressure. And then uh, the lacto vegetarians had about a 60% uh, reduction in getting blood, high blood pressure. And then the vegans did the best. They were eating the most of those whole plant foods and they 
had an 80% reduction in getting high blood pressure. Diabetes was exactly the same, very similar rates on that. And so um, a, a really, really important uh, point uh, in some 90,000 people, a very large study looking at this. And so there's been many studies now uh, looking at the value of uh, a whole plant-based diet, a largely vegetarian diet. And so um, here's a summary article um, from Burkow and Bernard's um, saying uh, the following, after reviewing 80 scientific studies, doctors Burkow and Bernard concluded, randomized clinical trials have shown that blood pressure is lowered when animal products are replaced with vegetable products in both normal tensives and hypertensives. And uh, here's a, a, a large systematic review. So a very important uh, research study um, looking at many, many different uh, uh, prospective studies in this case and bring all that information. It's a huge job, bring all this information together to try to figure out what does the science say? And so here in 2017, um, this group uh, went ahead and did it. And it's a fascinating sum, uh, uh, study um, to give you just the summary points. Um, I, I put together a slide for that. So here are the food groups that um, either worsen your blood pressure or improve your blood pressure. We know a lot about this now. So notice that the food groups that lower blood pressure, they're all plant foods, um, pretty much. Um, there may be a couple exceptions, but this is uh, largely the case. And then higher blood pressure is largely uh, animal products and sugar sweetened beverages. And so nuts, whole grains, legumes, fruits, and, and green leafy vegetables lower your blood pressure. Uh, ra you, you raise your blood pressure if you eat red meat, fish, processed meat, sugar sweetened beverages. People are surprised about fish. I was too. But you know, um, fish ha has a lot of toxins in it nowadays, a lot of mercury, and it may have something to do with that. So um, that's, a, that's a great question why it's doing that, but it is a, a, a consistent finding. And so, um, you know, this whole plant-based diet is really fascinating when you look at it from um, kind of a, a, a spiritual uh, type perspective, because when you, when you look at the Bible and you see how uh, the original diet was um, recommended, you can see based on this, uh, this verse in the first chapter of, of uh, the book of Genesis, that the prescription for um, food was basically herbs and seeds and fruits and, and these kinds of uh, types of foods um, were the recommended food. And um, I think we do well to um, move in that direction. So why are plant foods so powerful? Well, um, dietary substances um, that are in plant foods relax your arteries. They make them get bigger. They go from being constricted to um, relaxing. And that's, uh, that's very, very helpful. So magnesium and calcium, uh, diets rich in magnesium and calcium, give your arteries the ability to do this better. So green leafy vegetables, legumes. So the little tiny uh, legumes, the beans and, and so on, um, very loaded with magnesium. Green leafy vegetables are loaded with calcium and magnesium. Nuts and seeds, uh, very high in magnesium. Um, so nuts and seeds are healthy. They are not unhealthy, they're very healthy. Um, there are also ACE inhibitors, that drug ACE inhibitors, you know, the, the um, medications that uh, uh, we often use for uh, blood pressure control. There's medications in the food. Um, there's ACE inhibitors in the food. Here's the list. Um, and uh, you can make note of the various things, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of different things, a lot of variety of different things from grains to uh, tubers to um, nuts and seeds um, and so on. And of course, one of my favorite seeds is flaxseed. Flaxseed is very powerful for improving um, blood pressure. And this uh, study um, showed the same. Um, you know, um, basically it was a six month study and um, they ran, they, uh, it, was, it was blinded. Um, they were able to hide the ground flaxseed in muffins and various food products. And the people had no idea um, which one they were eating. And um, they monitored their blood pressure. And at the end of six months, this is what they found that the systolic blood pressure was 10 points lower. And the diastolic blood pressure was seven points lower in the flaxseed group compared with placebo. Um, whereas if they entered the, tri um, the um, trial and they had uncontrolled blood pressure, they didn't have it 
um, in, um, more stable. Um, and they just looked at those subset of folks. The reductions were even greater. It was 15 points uh, systolic and seven points diastolic. So excellent stuff. And um, here you can see them in the graph, um, the improvements as, as uh, time went on with the blood pressure. Um, this is diastolic and systolic. So wonderful uh, data there. And, um, and uh, use ground flaxseed, it's wonderful. About three tablespoons a day is excellent. If you're on a blood thinner already, maybe uh, cut that back a little bit because there is a little bit of blood thinning uh, action there. Uh, controlling calories. So um, that's the second one. We'll just take a really brief look at this. So um, um, in this particular trial, um, uh, um, they uh, were able to lose about eight and a half pounds. And that, um, and here you see eight and a half pounds and that uh, went ahead and improved the blood pressure um, systolic by about three points and about two points um, with an eight pound uh, weight loss. So, you know, as the weight goes off and as you get more weight off, um, you do uh, see an improvement. And of course, um, the sodium reduced in this trial as well. And so that um, likely improved it as well. Okay, so um, we just came off a class. Many of you have, uh, were, were in that class, so we won't spend much time on it, but weight loss is very important. And um, these principles, um, seven principles that we have on weight loss is in the book and very basic stuff. Don't focus on diets, focus on habits. Never make weight loss your sole focus. Don't be afraid to make those lifestyle changes. Exercise daily. Make clean breaks with problem foods. Eat a good snack. Don't uh, eat a good food, breakfast, don't snack. Look at me. <laughs> uh, eat a good breakfast, don't snack, and eat to satisfy simple hunger, not appetite. All right, and last, uh, decrease salt intake. So we know that there are some people who are more salt, salt sensitive than others. And if you're salt sensitive, um, you need to be really careful about this because you can really shoot up your blood pressure. As you age, it, it gets worse um, as you, uh, if you're of uh, Caribbean descent, African Afro-Caribbean descent, it's more likely. Um, this genetic marker can be tested, GNA1I2. Uh, um, and then those with hypertension, those with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, and obesity. So if you're starting to get the underlying chronic illnesses, you start to get more and more salt sensitive. All right, and uh, salt is a really um, important issue. Um, we know that um, you, um, lower your risk of heart disease and stroke. If you uh, lower your salt intake here, three grams, and, um, and it made a huge difference. There's um, a significant number of lives that could be saved if we just lowered our salt intake. And so uh, Bibbins Domingo um, back in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine um, gave this summary uh, statement, the cardiovascular benefits of reduced salt intake are on par with the benefits of uh, population-wide reductions in tobacco use, obesity, and cholesterol levels. A regulatory intervention designed to achieve a reduction in salt intake of three gram, uh, two three grams a day uh, would be more cost-effective than using medications to lower blood pressure in people with hypertension. Okay, so where's our salt found? People always say to me, hey, I don't use salt. I never use salt. I never add salt. Well, the thing is, is that over 75% of our salt intake is from processed and restaurant foods. And so they hide it in the food and you say, well, it doesn't taste that salty. Well, it's hidden and you can't taste it. And unless you are the cook, you don't know. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, we get some naturally occurring salt, which we need. Um, the more uh, salt in our water, for example, the more uh, our blood pressure tends to go up. Um, and while eating is only 6% of our salt intake is added salt. And then home cooking, uh, we add a little bit. But most of it is in the restaurant foods, for example, um, this spaghetti sauce. All right, and then lastly, we'll just uh, quickly look at um, beverages. Um, so um, what, is the what are the best blood pressure beverages? Well, definitely not alcohol. Um, alcohol um, uh, raises blood pressure, especially at three drinks or more a day, binge drinking for sure. And even moderate drinking um, puts on calories, can make you gain weight. Um, which will raise your blood pressure. And then if you're on me blood pressure medications, it's not a good idea to um, drink alcohol because of the uh, interactions that can occur. All right, uh, soft drinks. Um, soft drinks uh, are, are no better. And in fact, uh, soft drinks are, are a big problem when it comes to high blood pressure. And here's a, um, a look at multiple studies um, 
and what uh, the increased risk was of getting high blood pressure. So this is about a 6% increased risk up to about a 55% increased risk just with um, soft drink intake. So those who um, drank more soft drinks um, um, had a higher rate than those who uh, drank less soft drinks and um, the total uh, you know, um, summary statistics was about a 12% increased risk in these um, uh, six studies. And so they were able to find a dose-dependent effect in these studies, and that dose-dependent effect was 8.2% for every additional soft drink a day. Um, your, your risk of hypertension increases by 8.2%. Uh, okay, so what, why is this happening? Why, what, it doesn't make any sense. Why do uh, soft drinks uh, start uh, you onto the road of hypertension? Well, it has to do with weight gain. And um, the fact that liquid car calories um, do not provide you any satiety, that means feeling of full, feeling full, and, and therefore you don't limit any of your food at meals and you just add calories um, uh, separate from the meal or on top of the meal. All right, and so that's, uh, that's a really important point. So it's the weight gain and that's why um, you get um, blood pressure problems with soft drinks. So let's give an example. A 12 ounce can of soda packs 150 calories, 50 grams of sugar many times, 10 teaspoons of sugar uh, equivalent. And um, if you did that every day um, where you added a single soda every day and you didn't uh, change your, your intake at all, you would gain 15 pounds that year. Um, just one soda in addition to what you need for your daily calories. What about caffeine? Well, caffeine is very similar to adrenaline and caffeine raises your blood pressure as well. So if you're taking caffeinated drinks and you have high blood pressure, it doesn't make sense. Um, or the reviews of caffeine's acute effect on blood pressure indicate changes of three to 15 points systolic and four to 13 points diastolic. So these changes last for about 30 minutes, uh, or, or I'm sorry, start at 30 minutes and um, peak in one to two hours for four hours. And so um, it's a four hour effect. And if you're taking multiple soft drinks or, or coffee or, or caffeine or something per day, um, then you're gonna be uh, you know, raising the blood pressure throughout the day. So um, Dr. James, um, back in 2004, um, or, um, that far ago, long ago, um, uh, did a very critical review of this. And um, he felt that um, this issue of dietary caffeine should be taken more seriously. You can. If you like coffee, you can take decaffeinated coffee. That, that would be much better. There's extensive evidence that caffeine at dietary doses increases blood pressure. When considered comprehensively, findings from experimental and epidemiological studies converge to show that blood pressure remains reactive to the presser effects of caffeine in the diet. And that's from Dr. James's review of all the medical evidence at that time. So what should we drink then? Well, water. <laughs> Water, you, um, some people don't like water, they struggle to drink water, but I encourage you to find a way to get it in your, into your repertoire. Um, there, are re there is research showing that water is good for you. And um, in, for example, this study um, suggests, um, you know, based on the uh, associations that uh, those who drink more water have less uh, uh, fatal heart disease risk. Um, and it's, you know, it's about, 40% uh, improvement um, in women who drink more than five glasses of water a day. And it's about a, it's over a 50% uh, improvement in men who drink uh, over um, five glasses a day. So that's pretty fascinating. It has to do with the thickening effect of your blood um, when you're dehydrated. And then uh, fluids other than water, you know, there's an increased risk and, and, um, and that increased risk uh, you know, has been debated about, but has something to do with the, the concentration of the solu solutes that you're taking in, the, the amount of particles that are in the fluid, and the body has to take water out of the blood and, um, you know, uh, reduce the concentration of the solutes in the intestines so that the, uh, um, the solutes can go in without a big concentration uh, issue there. That's the hypothesis. Whether it's um, true, we still need to, to detail it out further. But um, you know, there is an increased risk seen um, if people are taking a lot of other fluids other than water, as in you know, six um, glasses a day of other fluids. So you know, um, less than two glasses a day of other fluids, that's probably um, not going to be as big an issue. 
But if you're living on, you know, soft drinks or even, even juices, if you're living on juices and taking a lot of it, there may be an increased risk, especially in those who are already at high risk. What about uh, other um, uh, issues, other problems um, that water can help? Here's a list. Constipation, that's obvious. Uh, diabetic issues, getting that blood sugar down, drinking more water helps uh, dilute the uh, high sugars. Um, urinary tract infections, lots of water. Kidney stones, lots of water. Your urologists are repeating over and over um, the benefits of water um, and neglecting it um, and getting kidney stone issues. And then even gallbladder disease is associated with um, water intake. All right, that's my lecture for tonight. And um, uh, hopefully we're not too far over. We are a little bit over. Um, go ahead and uh, um, we'll conclude at, um, my part and we'll let you um, go ahead and, and uh, break up into your groups. Um, uh, at this time.